So it has taken a while. I think I call Ed, inviting him to give a talk maybe six, five, six years ago, certainly before your back problems. But it's my pleasure, in fact, it's our pleasure, to welcome Ed Laswowska to give one of the Dean's seminars at McCormick. Uh, one of the benefits of belonging to the National Academy of Engineering is that you get to rub shoulders once in a while with the likes of Ed Lasowska or Gordon Bell in some committee or another one. And Ed is the Bill and Melinda Gates Chair of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington where he has been for over 30 years. And he's the one who put computer science at the University of Washington in the map, firmly at the top. Uh, his teaching and research focus on the design, analysis, and implementation of high-performance computing and communication systems. And more recently, he began exploring the techniques and technologies of data-intensive discovery. Ed is a long-time advocate for increasing the participation of computer science, increasing the reach of computer science, and serves on the Executive Advisory Council of the National Center for Women and Information Technology. It, the timing of the talk couldn't be better. Uh, today he will discuss the importance of using computer science to tackle society's most pressing challenges including healthcare, sustainability, and education. Please join me in welcoming Ed Laswowska. Well, thanks, Julio, for the uh, lovely introduction. I was very fortunate to arrive at the University of Washington with lots of other fantastic colleagues, and uh, we've made some progress in the past 30 plus years, but uh, uh, we've all sort of been along for the ride and been very fortunate. Uh, this talk is going to have very little technical content. I'm going to try and go very fast. I hope that 5 or 10% of it is interesting to uh, each of you, different people for different reasons. And to some extent, I'm going to talk about Kool-Aid that you've already drunk. I've heard about the, the uh, trajectory of computer science here that's planned and also met with a set of people today. It's just astonishing what's going on. So uh, what I'm going to do is give you sort of my view of what's going on in the field and uh, what the role of the field is in sort of the university in the world. And uh, uh, again, very quick, very superficial. Uh, you may have already drunk the Kool-Aid, but hopefully you'll find something interesting here. Uh, let's back up. Most of you are much younger than this, but that's anybody remember the Wayback Machine? Anybody under the age of 40 watch that cartoon? OK, so we're going back to 1969. And there were four really interesting things that happened in 1969. Can you remember any of them? What happened in 69? Great, landed on the moon, phenomenal engineering accomplishment. What else? Hmm? Woodstock. <laughs> Nobody remembers much. <laughs> the Mets won the World Series. They've done it once since then. And the first packet flowed over ARPANET. Okay? And it, that was ARPANET at the time. It had four nodes. It had these imps, these gigantic interface message processors. The bandwidth of a line was 56 kilobits per second. Okay? And uh, the, the first packet, this was, of course, it was not designed at that point for shopping or pornography or anything like that. It was for sharing expensive mainframe computers. And, and the first packet was Len Kleinrock's programmer, Charlie Klein at UCLA, trying to log into a remote computer at SRI. And the contents of the first packet were the characters L and O, which are the first two characters of login, and then the network crashed. All right? but, but these are Charlie Klein's initials on the log. He's still uh, around. I actually met him a few years ago. And now the question is, with nearly 50 years of hindsight, which of these had the greatest impact? And my claim is that unless you're really into Tang and Velcro, falsely attributed to the space program, the answer is clear. My kids and you and your kids use the internet uh, dozens, hundreds of times a day. You're probably mostly back there using it during this talk. Okay? And you know this sort of exponential trajectory we've been hooked to is 
the reason. And uh, the way I think about this is there are two things you get out of the exponential progress that we've made. One is constant capability at exponentially decreasing costs. So this is hard to read, but that's on a, a log scale on the left, semi-log paper, the cost of a fixed unit of random access memory flash and disk over time, right? Just linear on, uh, you know, on a log scale graph is exponentially decreasing. The alternative is exponentially increasing capability at constant cost. And of course, until about 2005, when the wheels came off the, course, the cart, that's what was happening to processor capability. So both of those are almost unprecedented in anything we experience. And it was, as a result, the, the power of an early mainframe is now an electronic greeting card in terms of millions of instructions per second. And it is literally the case that the entire computational power that got Apollo 11 to the moon is in a Furby, okay? <laughs> to millions of instructions per second of capability. This is not the greatest societal use of that capability, but it's still pretty amazing, okay? So now the question is, what have you done for me lately? And my view of this is that, uh, is that this sort of big data revolution that we see around us is what these exponential uh, trends are giving us this decade, okay? So, and you know, this is sensors everywhere. If you just think about your phone, it's uh, all information being created in digital form, so it doesn't have to be digitized. Storage is cheap, cheap. bandwidth is cheap. Uh, computation is cheap and scalable. Dave Patterson, a few years ago, made the following obvious statement in retrospect that on Amazon, a thousand computers for one day cost the same as one computer for a thousand days. And that's just completely unprecedented. Right? Um, algorithmic breakthroughs, models producing more data. And you know, so what is this big data thing? That's sort of how I've been spending my time the past few years. This is my favorite slide. Can you read this from back there? It's like teenage sex, everyone talks about it. Nobody knows how to do it. Everyone thinks everyone else is doing it, so everyone claims they're doing it. Okay? But I think the real story is that everything is becoming smart. And I saw lots of examples around here today. Again, the, the things going on here are uh, utterly amazing. But let me give you some examples, local and otherwise, in uh, each of these areas. They're really uh, quite astonishing. Shwetek Patel is a young faculty member at the University of Washington who's doing a bunch of work on sort of environmental sensors for the home. Okay, so. Um, a a as an example of smart homes work, he and his students have designed a sensor that you plug in anywhere in your home and it fully disaggregates your home electric energy usage. And it does it by using the noise on the power line as the signal that tells you what's going on, okay? So a compact fluorescent light modulates the line, a power supply modulates the line, the motor on your washing machine modulates the line. So by beginning from a database of what these things are roughly like and using some machine learning, he can get about a 95% accurate capture on who's doing what in your home. Okay. So, unbelievably cool. They have the same thing for water, okay? And the idea for water is uh, your whole home water system is hooked together through the hot water heater, sort of cold in and hot out. Um, and every time a valve opens or closes, it sends a pressure transient through the water line in your house. So, the sensor here is a rubber diaphragm that you thread over a hose bib that you're not using, and you open the hose so the home water system is pushing against the diaphragm, and there's a little coil behind it. So when you flush a toilet, it goes wubba, 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 and generates a little electric current, and you can, again, disambiguate what's going on. So this stuff has been licensed to Belkin. Another very clever thing he did for a company that unfortunately did not last very long is in the lower left, this. Uh, Wally sensor, and the idea here is environmental sensors, temperature, humidity, moisture, motion, that last 15 years on a watch battery. They're sort of the size of a clamshell, right? And the motivation here is it turns out the single most expensive homeowner claim uh, aggregated across the country every year is your refrigerator ice maker leaks on the floor. And it's expensive because you don't notice it until it's dripping through the ceiling of the room down below, at which point you've got to replace the sheetrock the insulation, you discover that your hardwood floor in your kitchen is warped, right? So the idea is, could you have a sensor that you would toss underneath the refrigerator and just let it sit there with the dust bunnies and not think about it for 15 years? And the technology trick is, how do you make it last 15 years on a watch battery, a little dime-sized battery? And the answer is that the sensing is cheap, it's the communication that's expensive. So suppose your Wi-Fi base station could be hooked up to your home's electric wiring and the electric wiring could act as an antenna. Okay, so this product comes in a box, came in a box with six sensors and a special Wi-Fi base station with a transformer, a power supply that couples it to the home electric system. Okay, and now suddenly the signal only has to get as far as the nearest wall. The walls become your friends and the electric wiring efficiently carries the signal back to the base station. 
Okay, so very cool stuff, but all based on uh, particularly uh, the power and water on sort of big data and machine learning, which is the secret sauce for everything. Okay, you're clearly familiar with smart cars. You know, we've gone from the DARPA Grand Challenge to the Urban Challenge to Google to the Tesla Model S. Uh, and, you know, the important thing is that even if you can't afford to pay eighty or hundred thousand dollars for a car, you probably have a car with adaptive cruise control or self-parking or something like that. And importantly, why is Google doing this? Hopefully they don't want to be GM. They certainly don't want to be GM, okay? But um, what they want to be is the data providers to people making autonomous vehicles in the future. And so the reason to be making autonomous vehicles is to learn what kind of data they need. Uh, Larry Smarr and I are on the board of a new Lee Hood startup company called Aravale down here, right? And uh, here's the idea. It is to do a complete gene sequencing, blood work, uh, urinalysis, saliva analysis, uh, uh, um, every quarter, okay, except for the sequencing, and correlate all of these data sets. Okay? And move towards truly personalized medicine. Right? Again, it's going to be utterly revolutionary. The amount of data they're dealing with is astronomical. The data pipelines are absolutely state of the art. We just had a scientific advisory board meeting last week, and uh, uh, there are only 1,000 customers now. The goal is to get it to 100,000 before long. Um, the notion is that people will pay a reasonable amount of money on an annual basis for this data and the coaching that goes along with it. Okay? So it's lifestyle coaching, diet coaching, things like this. It's been utterly revolutionary for me personally in some very uh, simple and retrospectively obvious ways. As an example, from my doctor, when I go and get my annual exam every three years or so, I get back uh, a blood report that has maybe a dozen numbers on it, all related to cholesterol. Okay? And from this exercise, every quarter, okay, longitudinally, I get back about 150 parameters. Okay, so as an example, I discovered I had preposterous levels of mercury in my blood, which explains a lot. Okay? And the coach, through an interview process, elicited from me that I was having tuna sushi at the snack bar in our building three days a week for lunch. Right? And my wife said, you know, you idiot, any woman who's ever been pregnant knows not to eat tuna. I had never got the memo. Okay? <laughs> but by doing nothing but changing from tuna sushi to salmon sushi, my blood mercury dropped in half in two months. Right? So the point is this sort of longitudinal availability of data is really interesting, but the ability to correlate uh, different data sets across large numbers of people is leading to tremendous insights. Um, obviously, robots are getting smart. Robots used to be bolted in the assembly line floor in Detroit and elsewhere, okay, moving parts from here to there. Now, you know, uh, iRobot may not be the greatest vacuum cleaner in the world, but the fact is it doesn't care where the chairs are and where the cat is. It more or less can navigate your house. Um, Zoran Popovic in my department and David Baker uh, created this program called Foldit. How many people have you used? Of you have used Foldit? Not very many. Okay, so here's here's the idea. Uh, David has a program called Rosetta. It's now sort of an open source program that's the world champion for protein folding and protein structure calculation. And you do this to devise novel enzyme catalysts or. Uh, um, or vaccines and things like that. You want a protein that folds up to a particular shape or has a particular function, right? And David uh, was using something like one-third of the University of Washington's machine room space to compute away on this. And at some point, he realized that what he was doing was embarrassingly parallel, okay? What you want to do is, uh, as you're trying to fold the protein to a minimum energy state, you want to avoid getting stuck in a local minimum. So the way to think about this is you start 100,000 people off at different starting points and let them optimize away. That's not quite how it works, all right? And they sort of report back. The local maximum version of this is if I'm in uh, Seattle and I want to find the highest point in the state of Washington, I would send you out and your algorithm would be walk uphill until you get to the highest point you can come to by following the gradient and then let me know how it's going, all right? And um, you would walk about a mile north of the University of Washington campus and you'd put up your flag and you'd be at 150 feet above sea level stuck in a local maximum. Okay? But if I parachuted 100,000 people down at random places across the state, one of them would wind up on the side of Mount Rainier and sure enough would get to the top of the uh, sort of highest point in the state. That's the idea. So David used Boink to turn this into a screensaver. Right? He would send out problems at night, the results would come back in the morning. And it was an animated screensaver, and he started getting emails from people saying, you may have the best program in the world, but it's unbelievably dumb. I see it doing this when it should be doing that. 
So he and Zoran Popovic turned this into a video game that has many, many, many tens of thousands of people doing protein folding. Uh, Louis von Ahn at Carnegie Mellon, who gets credit for starting a lot of this human computation work, uh, observed at one point that the number of person hours spent playing computer solitaire in one day is the number of person hours it took to build the Panama Canal. Okay, so the question is, could you turn some tiny fraction of that into useful work? And that's, this is an example of what that does. Uh, a couple of years ago, 50,000 gamers got their name on, I believe, a Nature paper for solving an AIDS-related protein structure problem that had baffled the science community for 11 years. Okay? So Zorin then turned his attention to applying this to education, and that's something that you're doing in spades here. The idea here is uh, uh, adaptive systems for teaching algebra to elementary school kids, okay? both with numerical problems and with, um, uh, with word problems. And you have to believe that adaptive, personalized education that responds to your state of knowledge and your learning style and your rate of learning in different areas is going to be better than the sort of fixed curriculum we learn. In fact, Zoram has found that even if you restrict yourself to a fixed order of concept presentation, the one that we use in curricula across the country is not particularly good. Okay? Um, so the Gates Foundation has now funded them to push this out into schools, and they have many, many, many hundreds of thousands of students using this, and suddenly they're getting data, and education has traditionally been, what's happening here? <laughs> has traditionally been an area in which we just haven't had access to data. Um, obviously, smart interaction, virtual reality, augmented reality, um, sort of motion through connect. Um, who's used Google Cardboard? Pretty remarkably good. I mean, I first used it when the New York Times sent me one at some point. Um, but the area in which uh, we're working in our department is uh, content creation. So Steve Seitz is 50-50 split between Google and the University of Washington. Astonishingly, UW was willing to deal with the intellectual property aspects of this. Steve spent two years building a computer vision group on leave at Google Seattle and now is back 50%. And an example of what they did was to build software called Jump which creates really studio quality VR movies from an array of 16 GoPro cameras. All right, so the question is, how do you produce the sort of con content that's really compelling without enormous amounts of labor? And that's what this software does. Steve's previous work was sort of stitching images together. Um, he also did uh, a neat version of this, which does uh, essentially VR images, not videos, okay? Uh, from your Android phone for your Android phone using cardboard. So think of this as being the equivalent of one of these 360 panorama programs that you would formerly use on your phone, except it constructs an image that you can now walk around inside. Um, we're trying to do another new building at our university now at, for computer science. And uh, a dozen years ago, the last time we needed a new building, the architects were using nothing but uh, sort of blueprints and cardboard models. Right? And now they're having us walk through different designs for the atrium using uh, a plastic equivalent of uh, Google Cardboard with Samsung phones. It's just astonishing the progress. And their software just generates this stuff. Okay? So they're largely out of the cardboard model business. Um, we have a, a major effort in, uh, in urban data science and are part of something called the Metro Lab Network. Something I mentioned to a few people here is Charlie Catlett at Argonne has done some amazing work. And it would be worth hooking up with, uh, uh, with Charlie here, but again, uh, uh, there's just an enormous volume of data available in cities, and many of you here are using this in very interesting ways. Um, finally, where I'm spending my time is smart discovery. So my late colleague Jim Gray referred to this as the fourth paradigm. Uh, the argument is that uh, science discovery for many centuries was empirical and experimental. It then uh, added a theoretical component. It then added a computational component in the 1950s, really sort of accelerating in the 1980s. And now we have this data intensive component. And importantly, all of these things build on one another. They don't replace each other. Um, so here's what this induces for me. And, and this is where the sort of real Kool-Aid begins. Um, core computer science is what I think of us and me as having done for 50 years. And we've had an incredibly great run making things faster and smaller and less expensive. And uh, and that work's going to continue. There are breakthroughs still happening in architecture and programming languages and compilers and networks. But this is what people care about. Okay? And the good news is that what people care about is connected to advances in the core of computer science by a set of newer areas. Okay? By 
uh, data science and visualization and machine learning and sensors and human computer interaction. Okay? And um, this doesn't mean that the work here is any less important. It simply means that we can uh, motivate advances there by the needs that society has to tackle a set of really important challenges and we can make ourselves central to tackling those challenges and we can do that in partnership with people across our universities. And again, I see tons of examples of that here and I'll talk to you in a bit about a few examples at the University of Washington. Now when Hank Levy and I first tried pushing this on our uh, computer science colleagues five or seven years ago, um, the question was, is all of this stuff computer science or not? And uh, on one hand, the answer is it's not computer science in isolation from other fields. You clearly do all this work in partnership with others. But he here's where I took my motivation from for this. Um, back in 1998, Bob Lucky, when he was running Belcor, had this uh, opinion piece in uh, IEEE Spectrum. And although it wasn't the title of the article, the money phrase was the last electrical engineer. And, what he, and, and this was the cartoon that accompanied the article. Right? And uh, the notion here is these are all the applications, okay? the things that people do, are doing with the fruits of electrical engineering. Uh, you know, these are all computer stuff, it turns out. Okay? And down here was the last electrical engineer. And what he said was, if we dismiss all of that other stuff, all the stuff people are doing with what we create as somebody else's business, then pretty soon there'll only be one of us. And he or she is going to be very well compensated, but one person isn't enough to sustain a field. Okay? And instead of taking that as a ding on electrical engineering, I took it as a cautionary tale for computer science. Because what I saw my department doing was rejecting people who didn't publish in transactions on X, where X is something that ACM publishes, published back then. Okay? So that's the idea. Alfred Spector referred to computer science as the ever-expanding sphere. And I think that's a great notion for what's uh, going on. You can take that as a positive for us. We're growing and embracing more. You can take it as a cause of concern for others. You're sort of being gobbled up by this sphere that keeps growing and growing and growing. But uh, let's look at the positive version of that. So um, in my department now, we've been making a set of investments in all these areas. And again, I see the same thing going on here. We're continuing to strengthen the core, but we have a serious story in every one of those peripheral areas. Okay, that is, you know, Zoran Popovic's work is education. Shwedek Patel's work is sensors for uh, typically energy and the environment. We have a tech policy lab I'll talk about uh, in a minute. Obviously, lots of Internet of Things work. Okay, so, um, so, and, 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 uh, so a lot of our investments have also been in these areas that provide the connecting tissue. Okay, so I think that's been really successful. And the, the concept here honestly, was that even if we could become as good as Stanford or Berkeley in computer architecture, um, first of all, it might not be possible. And secondly, it wasn't an efficient or a wise thing to do in, let's say, 2010. That if we thought that ultimately, in the next 50 years, computer science was going to be judged by how, our, how the extent to which we impact these societal grand challenge areas, then we could have a first mover advantage. Okay? So that was sort of the strategy. So here's some examples of things that we've been doing. And you have lots of examples here. But it's sort of where computer science sits in a university. And I think fundamentally it's central to the excellence of a university going forward. We have a Center for Sensory Motor and Neural Engineering joint with neuroscientists and biologists. And the goal here is prosthetics directly connected to the nervous system. Okay, but the uh, director of that is Raj Rao, who sits two offices away from me. We have the Center for Game Science, which is Zoran Popovic's operation. It's games for teaching and games for learning. Um, I lead the eScience Institute, which I'll say more about in a few minutes. Uh, we have a cross-campus collaboration in human-computer interaction. The core of that is computer science and the information school and human-centered design and engineering, but there are people from a dozen programs across the campus. Uh, we have an urban science effort that we nucleated out of computer science and the eScience Institute. Uh, we have a Center for Accessible Technology named after Ben Taskar, who spent, unfortunately, only a year with us before passing away at the age of 30-something. His wife actually runs this, and it's a really vibrant center for, uh, for uh, access technology. We have a campus-wide initiative in developing world, again, nucleated out of computer science and engineering, but with people from all over the campus. 
We have a Microsoft-funded tech policy lab that is led by somebody from computer science, somebody from the information school, and somebody from the law school. Okay, so these are just examples of tentacles extending out across the campus. Pervasive computing, a new educational initiative joint with Tsinghua University that Microsoft is bankrolling. Okay, so all of these things were sort of, uh, were central to the creation of them, but they now span the campus. And it's really, I think, transforming the University of Washington in interesting ways. And I think, it, in, in general, this philosophy is that, uh, uni let's see, that centers and institutes are the right way to think of the university of the future as opposed to departments and schools and colleges. Obviously, you have to be housed somewhere. There has to be an administrative structure. But what you want is agility going forward. And agility is centers and institutes that can be created when something's important by gathering people together and disbanded when it's less important. And those people can reform in other directions. Okay. So let me now talk about the eScience Institute briefly, just to give you a flavor of one of these, and it's the one I'm most familiar with because I've sort of created it and ran it. In 2007, we pitched the then president of the University of Washington. He's now off uh, running the NCAA. Um, and, and the argument was, look, th there is a new form of discovery that's going to be pervasive, and we're going to stop being a competitive university if we don't disseminate the ability to do data intensive discovery and become leaders not just in doing it but also in advancing the techniques and technology. And to Mark Embert's credit, he really got this and helped us move in that direction. Um, we got support from the University of Washington, and I'll describe what that uh, did in a sec, from NSF for an IGERT in data science that Magda Balazinska uh, coordinates. Uh, we in Berkeley and NYU got substantial five year funding from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and the Sloan Foundation. And the local foundation, the Washington Research Foundation, has supported us in important ways. And I'll show you how these pieces fit together, because it's been pretty important. Um, the, uh, the Moore Foundation and the Sloan Foundation were funding me and a set of other people to sort of do data science in conjunction with other fields. And what they sensed was that there were a set of institutional impediments, social impediments, at universities to driving this forward. And to be honest, these foundations do not care about computer science and statistics and applied math. They care about the social sciences, the physical sciences, and the non-human life sciences. And they were smart enough to realize that new partnerships and new career paths were going to be necessary. So what they're funding us in Berkeley and NYU to do is actually an experiment in social engineering. Okay? For example, can you create career paths in universities for people who build tools that accelerate the research of others? Can you get universities to credit you for publishing data that is widely used and influential, for publishing software that is widely used and influential? Okay. Uh, can you get people recognized for doing reproducible research? And can you come up with, uh, essentially, standards for what constitutes reproducibility? Okay. Can you hire faculty who are strong both in advancing data science methodology and in putting it to work in some field? and get those people adequately recognized for both types of work. Okay? So this is like a distributed collaborative experiment in which we agree to share not just what works, but what doesn't work. We're two years into a five-year project now. Okay? Um, so the notion here is uh, everybody has a set of participants on the science side and a set of participants in the methodology side. These things in the middle are the impediments that we saw as barriers to driving this out faster in universities. And the goal is to set up just this virtuous cycle in which methodological advances stimulate discoveries, which stimulate new methodological advances, and you go around faster and faster. That's the sort of high level idea of what we're trying to do. Um, importantly, our core faculty team obviously has methodology people, but also people in the life, environmental, social, and physical sciences. And we've been able to cherry pick the very best people in those fields, all right? You know, the best neuroscientist works with us, the best astronomer, the best oceanographer, the best sociologist. It's been uh, just a sort of gold mine. And after 30 plus years at the University of Washington, it's been incredibly great to discover all of these people across the university who are phenomenal and who I hadn't worked with before. Just this core team is 13 departments and five schools and colleges, okay? So it's just been a, a, a tremendous experience. Um, so here's some of what we do, and this will all be pretty obvious. I'll give you a couple of concrete examples. We have educational initiatives at every degree level and on Coursera and uh, sort of professional certificate programs. And here's what our pitch has been. I discussed this with someone earlier today. I think the question is, is data science more like computer science or computational science? And here's what I mean by this, okay? Uh, 
Computer science, I think, is a field with a recognizable intellectual center. People study it, and you hire people with degrees in it. Okay? I don't think anybody hires anyone with a degree in computational science. There are probably some of those degrees out there, but you hire an astronomer or a physicist or a chemist or a sociologist, and that person happens to use computational techniques because that's how discovery is done in that field these days. Okay? Uh, our approach is that uh, that, that is the model for data science, okay? So we do not have degree programs in data science at the undergraduate or the doctoral level. Rather, what we have is multi-course modules that go into the programs of students, and they get at the University of Washington what's called a transcriptable option. That means if you check the appropriate boxes, you get a notation on your transcript that says you did biology with the data science option, okay? So the idea is people are not gonna hire a data scientist at the master's level, maybe, for business, okay? But they're not gonna hire someone with a PhD in data science or a bachelor's degree in data science. They're gonna hire a biologist who has a set of capabilities that allow her to do work in different ways. Um, the provost gave us uh, nine half faculty positions, right? And uh, th these were given to the eScience Institute. We don't have faculty positions. What she actually gave us was the funding for nine half faculty positions. And if someone in another unit wants to hire someone who is strong both in data science methodology and in some field like astronomy, say, right, they can pitch us. And if that person is above our quality bar and above our methodology bar, we can ask the provost to pay half their salary in perpetuity. And in return, we get half their teaching cycles and half their service cycles. And half the teaching cycles means that they have to teach 50% of their courses uh, have to be of interest and enrollment to people outside of their home department or in addition to their home department, okay? And this has been a gold mine. The people we've been able to recruit have been utterly phenomenal. And the first six of the nine are in astronomy, neuroscience, sociology, mechanical engineering, statistics. I'm forgetting a couple, but they're all across the campus, okay? Um, the Washington Research Foundation, which is a local foundation, WRF is, was our tech transfer office before we had one. Uh, there's this rat poison called warfarin, okay? And the WARF in warfarin stands for Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. It's the same thing. WARF was the University of Wisconsin's tech transfer office before they had a tech transfer office. And you know, their two big discoveries were the process that puts vitamin D into milk and rat poison. Ours was something that became hepatitis B vaccine. So WRF has provided substantial funding to four projects, and one of the things we did with it was to provide term-limited professorships, chairs, and startup packages that have allowed us to recruit into these provost positions unbelievable people. So, for example, the astronomer we recruited is the chief data scientist on LSST, the next big survey astronomy project, okay? And he had offers from Johns Hopkins and Princeton and Berkeley and the Space Telescope Research Institute. There's no way he would have wound up at the University of Washington without help from the Washington Research Foundation. So that sort of package has been really instrumental. Um, we have a set of postdocs and graduate students who are mentored both by an applications faculty member and by a methodology faculty member. And of course, a set of seminars to cause them to hang together. Uh, a set of professional data scientists. We got that job category stuck in the University of Washington personnel system, whose job is partly doing their own research, but partly facilitating the research of others. Um, we have space, like your building, it's got plenty of orange in it. So this is, in fact, on the top floor of the physics astronomy building, making it clear that what we're doing is not part of computer science and stats and applied math. The goal is driving forward discovery in other fields. Um, lots of training and mentoring activities, and uh, both deep partnerships and an incubation program. And the incubation program has been really interesting. What happens is, a couple of times a year, we let people pitch us with a little two-page proposal. And it says, I've got the following science problem. It has a data science component I don't know how to handle. Uh, I think it's general enough that if you helped me, the solution would be useful to others. And most importantly, I'm going to come and do the work, OK? Half time for the next quarter. So we're in the business of giving out free advice rather than free labor. And the idea is these people return to their labs with a problem solved, with new expertise in methodologies, and with a set of software skills they didn't have before. These are not folks who ever used Python or GitHub, okay? And that sort of starts to permeate the campus. So let me give examples of two of these very quickly. 
Uh, we've done a lot of work with oceanography. My colleague Bill Howe is principally responsible for this. And uh, Ginger Armbrust, who's on our executive committee, is the oceanographer. She's the, uh, the director of our School of Oceanography. And she does environmental metagenomics, which is sort of sequencing the stew in a body of water before and after an environmental event and exploring the differences. And the challenges she faced were, first of all, integration across different data types, and secondly, uh, the use of distributed and remote sensing and labs. And what Bill built for her was a system called SQL Share, which is a data management system for people who don't speak SQL, uh, don't know what a schema is, and don't want to run a database system. Okay, so roughly it's cloud-based. You cram the data into a, uh, a, a cloud-based data management system without a schema, and by an interview process, which Jim Gray originally taught us, the dozen most common science questions that her labs asks are sitting there in English, and you click it, and the SQL shows up. Okay? And uh, people who couldn't generate SQL are pretty soon editing it into adjacent queries, and before long, they're writing it, OK, because these are smart people. Right? And the computer science in this is how much of it could you automate? Right? To me, a big challenge for all of us is making our tools usable by people who aren't us, and we're terrible at that. Right? So this has been really tremendously successful. Um, an experiment we did two years ago or so um, involved Ginger bringing together a set of physical, chemical, and biological oceanographers, all of whom had gone out on the same cruise, all of whom had collected their own data and brought it back to their own labs and never talked to one another again. Okay? And this was to be a meeting in which the physical and chemical and biological oceanographers would talk about what research they might be able to do if they collaborated. And instead, what happened was uh, Bill and Dan and Constantine put all their data into SQL Share before this meeting and showed up at the meeting. And they spent three days actually doing science instead of talking about what science they could do. And it was completely transformational. Right? As with everything else, all the action is sort of at the interfaces. Um, there's also a lot of automation of their data flow. So uh, now what happens is data is pushed directly to the cloud from the ship-based instruments, uh, which again is not rocket science, but totally different from what they were formerly doing. Here's, here's a second example. This is one of dozens of incubation projects. This one came actually from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This past summer, we ran a special incubation set of six projects. The theme was data science for social good. So these were urban data problems that people were interested in. Uh, the, the teams involved some of our data scientists, people from the sponsors, two from the Gates Foundation here, um, uh, data scientists, uh, graduate students, undergraduate students, and a set of, in this case, uh, 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 high school students from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds. And here's what the problem was. Um, it, there are uh, a set of, so what the foundation is interested in is investing in programs that are effective at reducing homelessness. Okay? And there are many, many different interventions when families become homeless. And they're pieced together in many different ways. And some of them lead to happy outcomes, and some of them don't. Okay? So the idea was to take the homelessness data from these three counties. Um, and um, this, again, is an example of the different paths through the programs. Clean the data. Um, and as with any data science problem, a large part of it is cleaning the data. These family units are not like yours and mine. Is this the same family unit or a different one? Is it the same instance of homelessness or a new one? Okay, develop algorithms to cleaning the data in consultation with these folks. Um, and then uh, put it in forms that they can visualize and understand. So this is showing sort of different paths through the system leading to different uh, uh, exits. The most successful exit is non-subsidized permanent housing. A less successful but still positive outcome is subsidized housing. And the uh, sort of bad exit is back to homelessness. So without spending more time on this, lots of different ways through the system. And um, the Gates Foundation had paid a million dollars to a consulting firm to look at this problem over the period of a year and had come up with nothing they could use. Right? But a set of uh, undergraduate and graduate and high school students with little guidance came up with something that's extraordinarily useful to them in 10 weeks. And they're now funding continuation of the work. So this is the sort of stuff I think is really, really interesting. So I'm almost about to wrap up here. Let me talk about the role of computer science in the world, having talked about the role of the university. And there are a set of different things here. One is, I think, you know, every citizen needs to know some amount of this stuff. Uh, you know, it's, it's what Jeanette Wing called computational thinking, which is 
uh, which is a, not a particular operating system or programming language. It's a way of approaching the world. It has to do with uh, you know, algorithms and debugging and modeling. Uh, you know. um, second, every field is becoming an information field. You need to know more than a first course. And third, uh, all the jobs are in computer science. And, uh, and many of those jobs are not in the computing industry. In fact, typically 70% of jobs that involve computer science are not in what we think of as the computing or software industry. Okay, so I'll give you some examples of that in a sec. Um, here's some data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics just to drive this home. Every piece of data I show you has an asterisk, and I'll try and describe those asterisks. So if you start getting offended by this, wait for the asterisk. Um, BLS, every two years, publishes job projections for the next decade, and they always lag by a couple of years. Okay, and this is job growth in STEM from 2014 to 2024. This data was just released a month or two ago. Okay? Now, here's the asterisk. Okay? The asterisk is that being a healthcare professional is not considered a STEM occupation, for example. Okay? Being a biologist is a STEM occupation. Right? But I think it's reasonable to compare, for example, computer science to engineering because it, people educated as engineers typically work in engineering. There aren't a lot of things that are engineering that aren't classified as engineering occupations. Okay? So this is job growth, and with the asterisks, what you see is that 73% of the projected job growth is in computer occupations, 10% in other fields of engineering, 3% in the life sciences, 3% in the physical sciences, 5% uh, in the social sciences, 6% in math. That's up from 3% because of math's contribution to data science. It was 3% two years ago. Okay? If you look at all jobs available, whether newly created or available to, uh, due to retirements, computer science drops to a mere 55%. It's a younger field, and engineering grows to 26%. Uh, importantly, engineering and computer science added together are 80% uh, in either of these. All right? So uh, the, the person in uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics who used to collect these stats until a few years ago, a guy named John Sanders, used to say that all of STEM is hiding behind computer science. I would say all of STEM is hiding behind computer science and engineering. Okay? That is where the gap is. Um, uh, the uh, folks at code.org used this same data to project that 16% of all new wages across all fields, not just STEM fields, are due to computing occupations. Okay? Um, two years ago, uh, three different state organizations in the state of Washington looked across all fields for any fields where there was a gap between degrees granted and jobs available, and they only found four. Okay? And there were only two of them at the undergraduate level, computer science and all of engineering. In every other field, there were at least as many degrees granted as there were jobs available. Okay? Small gaps in the health professions and in scientific and engineering research at the graduate level only. Okay? And this is not so different than the rest of the country. Um, there's a study ongoing now of King County's aerospace industry. Okay? First of all, the software industry in the state of Washington now employs more people than the aerospace industry, partly because our aerospace industry is walking out of town as fast as it can. But what this reveals is that the aerospace industry in King County, the county in which we and Boeing are located, employs four times as many computer specialists as aeronautical engineers. Okay, so that's just one example of other industries riding on computer science. They're, they're, every measure of their workforce gap looking forward is computer science. Okay, a little hard to read, but for example, they now have 11,000 uh, computer systems analysts employed and uh, 2,611 computer network architects, 2,942 aerospace engineers, just astonishing numbers. Um, so students are responding to all of these things, and uh, you feel it here as well as anyone feels it anywhere. Uh, demand for introductory courses, demand for upper division courses, demand for the major. And I think it's due to these different factors I enumerated before. You know, intro courses is the computational thinking thing. Uh, upper division courses is, gee, I want to be a biologist, but I need to know more than a first course in computer science to be successful. Demand for the major is it's good preparation for pretty much anything. So, this is our intro courses, two intro courses in uh, the past, what, back to 2004. So that's a decade, right? And um, what you see now is our first intro course has just gotten to 3,000 students a year. 
Okay? Our second intro course is now just above 2,000 students a year. Just an unbelievable operation. We, unlike you, have a one course fits all approach to intro computer science. And here's the reason, sorry, here's a result, okay? 58% of the women who become our major did not have that intention when they took the first intro course, okay? So our concern has been that if we have a terminal intro course, large numbers of people who could be highly successful majors will choose the terminal course and wind up in something else, okay? So the goal has been to have a one-size-fits-all course, even though one size doesn't really fit all well, but not have any terminal courses, okay? With the goal of having a lot of people come in and discover a passion for computer science and an ability to doing it and become majors. Um, this is the top 10 first choice majors of confirmed incoming freshmen at the University of Washington from 2008 to 2015, okay? UW has 120 different undergraduate majors, okay? Um, and these are kids who actually showed up. Now, of course, many of the students who said computer science was their first choice major will change their mind. They didn't know what it was, okay? They get excited about something else. And as I just mentioned, many students who come not intending to do computer science switch in, okay? But still, this is quite astonishing. So we've blown by biology and we're about to tackle the business school. And remember that these folks down here uh, with uh, the first choice major between 125 and 300 students, uh, those are still among the top 10 of 120 majors at the University of Washington. And again, this is happening across the country. It's just astonishing. Top 25 concentrations at Harvard, that was computer science in 2007-08. There's computer science today, okay? Um, this is interesting. Again, Harry Lewis got this data for me last week. This is the distribution of science majors at Harvard by percent. So what you see is a, an interesting decrease in life sciences and a rapid increase in computational and mathematical sciences, and the physical science is pretty steady. Okay, there's an interesting shift in student interest in a campus where students can, are, are, first of all, like here, all very capable and have any choice of major at all. Um, this is older data back in 2014 showing for Berkeley uh, enrollment in upper division courses by letters and sciences students who are not computer science majors. Okay, so really a dramatic increase in upper division course taking by people who aren't majors. So really amazing changes. In K to 12, you know, uh, participation in the CS advanced placement exam is still pathetic, but it's grown enormously in the past four years. It's the fastest growing AP exam. Code.org is going to accelerate this like crazy. crazy. Hadi Partovi is a Seattle guy who has just done amazing stuff with code.org. Um, the numbers from a few days ago is uh, 236 million students have participated in the hour of code. It's astonishing, okay? 11 billion lines of code. Uh, in the first hour of code three years ago, more women and more underrepresented minorities programmed, if only for an hour in a drag and drop way, than in the entire 50 year history of the field. Okay, so I think what's going to happen is more and more students are going to be interested in this and capable of doing it. Um, so let me talk about the institutional response in K-12. In 1983, uh, there was this report called A Nation at Risk that looked at K-12 education in this country. And the money phrase was, if an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might well have viewed it as an act of war. As it stands, we allowed this to happen to ourselves. Okay, that was 1983. This report said that in order to graduate from high school, you should have a half year of computer science. Now that's not a lot, but remember that computing back then was a PCXT with 128K of RAM, okay? So it was a long time ago, okay? So let's go forward 30 years to this report from uh, 2013 by the National Academies, 401 page report, 15 page index, a framework for K to 12 science education. Let's look in the index. Here's what they say about energy, but they say don't forget to look at force and motion, okay? What does the index say about computer science? There you go. And almost every one of those is a reference to an explanation for why they chose not to include it, despite being told they should. Okay, so that's the progress we've made in 30 years, okay? That begat the next generation science standards, which never mentioned computer science, okay? Um, despite it all, progress is being made, okay? Uh, in, in three out of four high schools, computer science that includes programming isn't offered, but that's dramatically better than just a couple of years ago, largely through the force of code.org, okay? 
In 22 of the 50 states, computer science doesn't count towards the math or science graduation requirement, but that means in 28 it does, and two or three years ago it was only 14. Okay, so it's being recognized as a math or science course across the country, so we're really making amazing progress. Um, President Obama, a couple of months ago, as part of the State of the Union, announced that he's putting $4 billion into grants to enhance uh, teacher preparation to provide computer science education in K-12. to So good stuff happening. Higher ed, uh, I think there are a lot of positive signs. Uh, schools of computer science are proliferating, and I think that's, it's, it's a pretty important trend. We're not doing it. I think it depends on local reasons. But to me, the important thing is that wh whatever the prefix, whether it's a school or a department or whatever, uh, computer science needs to be viewed as a unit of the university because it has a, a sort of pervasive impact assuming that programs behave that way. Okay, that pervasive impact is really important. Um, there is some tendency on the part of many universities to view the current situation as a transient. Okay, that is, hire lecturers, use faculty from other fields. Um, this is the uh, NSF data on degrees granted in computer science, and it is indeed cyclic, but the trend is pretty clear. Okay? And it seems to me that there are a set of kind of structural changes in occupations in which more and more occupations have a computational component that suggests that the importance of computer science education is going to increase, and we're not experiencing a transient. So, the investments you're making here, I think, are really important, and other people need to do it. Um, facilities are a huge problem, okay? And facilities have two different impacts. One is scale, and the other is the nature of the field. So uh, when we built our, our now 12-year-old new building in 2001 to 2003, um, uh, we had been crippled by a lack of lab space. The field had moved into a field where people are, you know, building robots and, uh, and doing uh, wet lab work uh, in conjunction with biologists, we had no way to do that, okay? So the lab space changed not just how many students we could educate, but what kind of work we could do, okay? And that transformation is important, so space really matters. Um, here's the final thing I'll mention, and I'm almost done, is that I think there is plenty of room for growth and investment. Um, this is, again, a misleading chart with an asterisk, but here's what I've done. I've taken the Bureau of Labor Statistics job projections for various fields, okay? And uh, I've taken the science and engineering indicators, uh, bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees granted for fields. So this is computer science. Red is degrees granted. Blue is annual bachelor's degrees. Yellow is, sorry, excuse me. Red is annualized jobs available from BLS. Okay, so that's jobs available. Then you have bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. Uh, this is engineering fields. Okay. This is the life sciences. You see vastly more degrees than jobs, but remember medicine is not included. All the students are in the social sciences. You know, coming from the city where Starbucks is headquartered, this is great because well-educated baristas are really important. Aren't they? Um, the physical sciences and the math sciences. Okay. So I think, um, you know, as student interest continues to grow, responding to that student interest by growing programs makes a lot of sense. So that's the story. I think it's an unbelievably exciting time because we're now coupled to all aspects of society and coupled to all aspects of universities. And uh, it's, I just think, a transformational time. And for universities and society and computer science programs, it's going to be absolutely amazing. That's it. Thank you very much. I realize we're at the end. If there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them. That Thank you. It will fit in your carry on. If not, we'll make it. It will. Thank you. So, someone has to leave. Five, do so, but we will have time for some questions. So, who, who is first? Questions, comments, anything? Okay, I'll. I'll who, oh, Larry. Ed, that was great. I have two questions, actually. The first is, um, uh, on the success you had persuading your colleagues that this other stuff would be computer science or could be part of computer science, um, and you, you, I think, did a lot to show how data science could be viewed by other fields as something that they would really want to connect with. But other things in computer science besides data science, how easy has it been to persuade other fields that they 
that this is something that's going to be valuable for them in a, um, you know, in. Well, it, it seems to me you've done a great job here. You, you, like we, have great partnerships with their education school. You know, as an example, you have you know one of the leading journalism schools, and you've got great partnerships with your J school. So, you know, I think we're uh, we're past the age of being uh, of being insecure that we're being viewed as a handmaiden and programming. I mean, only the physicists view us as uh, as inferior these days. I think we have a peer relationship with almost everyone else, and my astronomy friends say about the physicists, don't feel badly, they treat me the same way. So I, 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 I think uh, that uh, the, the, whatever resistance may have existed seems to have dissipated tremendously, particularly among the best people. Of course, the business school probably feels that way about everybody, but um, my, my other question is that as, as you start doing this, like how do you sort of preserve the community of computer science itself and make sure that these ideas kind of come back into the core and kind of circulate sort of, uh, it just seems like it's a, it's a pretty diff big and diffuse thing and that's beautiful, but there's also this sort of, how do we get the lessons learned from one side to end up like, you know, something in biology to end up in social science or, I'm, I'm talking about the computer or data science lessons to go around like that. Right, so um, in, in data science, the way this has worked is physical proximity, okay? Uh, that, that work is now all taking place in that data science studio and you discover that uh, things that you've helped the biologists with are actually of use to the astronomers. And there are lots of examples of that that have uh, come to the fore in the past couple of years. I think the real challenge is as you continue to grow, how do you maintain some kind of coherence? So that's been a challenge for us and it will be a challenge for you as you expand. You know, you're going to uh, not quite double your size, but you've got to maintain some kind of, uh, of coherence. And, you know, culture is incredibly important. And, uh, you know, I think one thing to do is there are, are a set of people who think about this in a corporate context, and they probably know some things we don't know because we don't think about this very much in universities. Okay? But, but I think this, note, you know, uh, for, for us, the, the biggest challenge is we've grown, and we're more than 50 faculty now, has been to, uh, uh, we have always operated as a committee of the whole, and that becomes uh, less and less possible, we're still trying to do it, okay? So, uh, it, it, sorry? So what's the number? The faculty number is probably 55, but growing towards 70. Uh, and that d doesn't count lecturers. We have five or six lecturers, okay? So we're above 60 if you count lecturers. And so, you know, when we do faculty hiring, we're sitting in a room with 60 of us. And, uh, uh, you know, the basic model is uh, you go around the circle and everybody repeats what everybody else has said, and that's an exponential algorithm, you know? <laughs> you know so. Email threads are already pretty intense, so I can't wait for that. Yeah, but, but, but for us, we, we just choose to keep putting in the time in order to maintain some sort of coherence. So, for example, we continue to do faculty hiring as a committee of the whole, and that's so been the, really important. The number that anthropologists are a number, the number, number. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have room. Okay. So, so here's another example of something that we did in our, in our current building, and I don't know how this will persist, but we, uh, uh, we had a retiring faculty member do office assignments to the faculty as we moved into a new building. This was Jean Lubert. And what he did was to locate each individual the furthest from the people they interacted with. Okay. And the goal was I was going to walk arbitrary distances to work with Hank Levy, okay? Because we've been working together for a decade, we were going to keep it up. But there were all sorts of people who I didn't spend any time with, and those are the people with adjacent offices, and now I work with them all the time, okay? Uh, similarly, we've always had heterogeneous grad student offices. This is breaking down a little bit because the laboratory space means people spend more time in their focused lab. But the grad offices have always had a mixture of students from different sub-areas in order to try and generate cross-fertilization. You know, some of the things I worry about are uh, uh, we are, uh, let's see, as, uh, for example, as standards rise, okay, as the quality of students rise, we're less willing to take risks on people, okay? I discussed that with some folks today. What's happening, I think, across the field is the mean is rising and the variance is decreasing, okay? And there are two aspects to the variance. There's excursions on the low end, which maybe aren't good, and there's excursions on the high end, which are fantastic. And I think we don't have the excursions on the high end anymore. Okay? And many of those people who came to our graduate program or to our faculty with some, I'm going to say, deficiency, some quirk, 
uh, turn out to have been rocket ships, just sort of invisible to us at the time. And so having the discipline to keep taking risks is very, very difficult. Anis, I, I completely agree with you that um, departments exist because one is, they are the units to get tenure lines. They are the ones who make the decision about tenure. Sometimes you have two departments, but you have to think on how to do it. And then is what gets rank as opposed to horizontal things. So, but my belief is that vertically integrated things are kind of gone. They will exist in some way. So the question is going forward. And the other thing now is that maybe half, if not more, of the people that you hire, they fit in at least two units. And I'm sure it's the same thing happens with you. So as time goes on, the, the structure that you have to make bureaucratic decisions, like tenure, they have always fall behind. Are you exploring some creative ways in which to do these things? Or may, maybe the structures that you had in the past work for you as well? So a, a couple of comments. With these faculty members that were recruiting these provost initiative slots, we, one of us from the, uh, the, actually the five members of the core team, sits on their annual review committee and sits on their promotion and tenure committee. Okay? So what that does is to help ensure that the home department gives them credit, adequate credit for the work they're doing that's outside of the home department. Okay? And that's been pretty effective. We've had two tenure cases so far and both have sailed, actually three have sailed through. Okay? Um, there's an advantage that the University of Washington has. You'll have to cut this out of the recording, OK? Um, we are not of the uniformly high quality that Northwestern is or that Berkeley is, OK? And uh, that uh, means that a, a number of our units, d despite what I just said about risk taking, are willing to take risks, OK? So we've noticed just in sort of the Berkeley, NYU, UW, collaboration that I think NYU and UW have an advantage by honestly being less overall excellent than Berkeley is. Mm. All right. um, it, it sounds Surprise. easy to say that, but I think it's a real advantage because people are willing to take risks because they don't necessarily want the, you know, the very best neuroscientist by the conventional existing standards of neuroscience. Okay? So I think there's actually a fair amount of flexibility that arises from not being at the very pinnacle. Wow. Okay, any other thing? Don't tell anyone I said that. No. But, I, so but I, I, I think it really has been important. Again, we are extremely grateful to you for having taken the time and visit us. This was a wonderful presentation. Thank, Thank you, Ed. Thank you so much. Wonderful to be here.